Good afternoon, everybody. I know, I know it's a challenge to uh, attend a talk immediately after lunch, um, but I'm trying to, I, I'll try to keep this uh, uh, short and sweet. So uh, my name is Ajay. I work as a data scientist at OpenSignal. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about um, uh, a library that I built that will let you do fast offline uh, reverse geocoding. So this is the outline of the talk. So I'm going to start off giving you a background about OpenSignal, what we do there, and uh, tell you why I built this library. Uh, then I'm going to talk about how I implemented it, so give you more details about uh, you know, the library. And then I'll give you a demo on how to use it. I'll then discuss the performance results. So the uh, TLDR version is that it can geocode like uh, 10 million coordinates in less than 30 seconds. I'll then show you how it's applied within OpenSignal, so you can get some ideas on what to do uh, in, your, uh, in your own company. And lastly, this is an open source library, so I'll discuss some of the uh, contributions that I've received from the community, which I'm really that, that thankful for. So on with the show. Um, so what is OpenSignal? So OpenSignal uh, uh, specializes in uh, wireless coverage mapping. So what we do is we crowdsource our data from users of our Android and I iPhone apps. And we collect data in the form of uh, signal strength, signal quality, data speeds in uh, cellular as well as Wi-Fi. And till date, we've basically um, c collected about 41 billion uh, cellular data points, 50 billion Wi-Fi data points, and our users have run approximately uh, 93 million speed tests. Um, and what we do is we provide insights as to which is the best operator in, at, a, at a given location uh, in terms of coverage as well as data speeds. Uh, we also run reports that you can see online, like uh, you know the state of LTE, just to see what L how LTE is across the globe. Um, and recently, we've launched an application called uh, Wi-Fi Mapper, which you should uh, check out. Like it'll let you find free Wi-Fi hotspots around you. Um, so as I said, we basically collect about you know. 50 50 million data points per day, and we'd like to know where this data is coming from in terms of location. So uh, uh, reverse geocoding is quite important in what we do, uh, which is basically converting a set of GPS coordinates into locations. Um, so as I saw, there were like a few options that were open to me. One was using online web services like uh, Google Maps and OpenStreetMap. Uh, but what I found is that it's uh, very restrictive in terms of you know, the number of requests that you can make per day. Uh, and of course, you can trick the system. Like OpenStreetMap isn't as smart as Google Maps. But that's not the point. It's very slow. Um, and so some of the offline options is using uh, PostGIS uh, databases. So for that, what you need to do is you need to have some kind of um, uh, bounding box or define like a uh, polygon sh shape file that defines what you know the region looks like for a given place. Um, but it's, it gets very complex since it's not very um, scalable and it's quite slow. Uh, there's also a, a Python library, which I'll talk about next. So I mean, the motivation was basically to build a fast offline uh, reverse geocoder. So I found this library that was built by uh, Richard Penman. Um, but there were some limitations. So I've, so I've improved on that you know, in the following ways. So basically, the new library supports uh, uh, Python versions 2 and 3. And it geocodes a lot more information. So besides the place name and the, and, you know, the country code, you also get uh, administrative regions, levels 1 and 2, and also the uh, coordinates of that place. So you can see how far it is from your input coordinate. But the key feature is performance. Um, uh, you know, the, li uh, the library is open source, and it's uh, licensed under LGPL. And to date, uh, it's received about 2,600 downloads with uh, 41 commits from five committers. So it's received pretty um, oh, a good uh, response from the community. Um, now, the implementation. So the library has two modes, basically. Uh, mode one is a single process mode, so it's very simple. Uh, but the default mode is mode two, which is um, multi-process, so it exploits you know, the CPUs and cores that you have on your machine. Um, the source of the data is the uh, GeoNames database. And you know the library comes with a list of places that have a population of uh, greater than 1,000, um, and you know so, so the uh, total number of places and cities is about uh, 
145,000. So uh, when you load the library, all these uh, GPS coordinates of these places are uh, loaded into a KD tree. And I use the uh, nearest neighbor algorithm to find out which is the, which is the place uh, closest to your input coordinate. Um, now for mode one, there's basically a class that's provided by SciPy that does this. Uh, it's called CKD tree, uh, and it implements the uh, nearest neighbor algorithm, uh, but it's uh, single threaded. So I've, I've basically extended that class for mode two and implemented a parallelized version of it. Uh, so the dependencies for this library are NumPy and SciPy. Um, now, the parallelized KD tree. So basically, I use the uh, multiprocessing module. Uh, so the advantage over the threading module, uh, I think this was mentioned in one of the first talks today here, um, it's that uh, it exploits you know, the multiple cores and CPUs, and also it doesn't have the uh, uh, global interpreter lock limitation. Basically, each process has its own interpreter and therefore its own JIL, so you don't have that limitation. But the cons are that it has separate um, memory spaces, so you'll have to do some form of IPC or shared memory. Uh, so I use the uh, latter approach for the library. So basically there's a very simple scheduler that divides the input that you provide into fixed chunks, and uh, the uh, number of chunks is uh, equal to the number of cores that you have on your machine. And uh, these chunks are processed in parallel, and the output is written back down into the uh, shared memory. So it's, it's uh, quite a simple uh, 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 architecture uh, conceptually, and the KD tree basically has you know the fo 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 following uh, settings that are set like. Um, the distance that I use is, you know, the Euclidean distance. Although this is not the most accurate distance measure that you can use for GPS coordinates, uh, it works quite well for uh, places and uh, administrative regions since you're uh, dealing with a much higher level. But I am working on the uh, have assigned uh, distance formula, which will be released in the next version. So uh, please, uh, you can uh, uh, keep track of that on. Uh, uh, GitHub. And the uh, distance upper bound is infinity, so basically what this means is that I query the entire tree to find the nearest neighbor. I mean, you could optimize it if you, if you want to just uh, query a smaller subset, but this works. Um, one good uh, tutorial that I would recommend is this one on uh, multiprocessing by uh, Sterla Molden. So I basically got a lot of inspiration from that to implement this uh, class. Now, I'll, I'll give you a quick demo on how to use this library. So I have a IPython book. Great. So you would install the uh, library like any other. So you just use uh, pip uh, to install the reverse geocoder library. And this is how you would import it. Let me just run that. Now this is an example, a very simple example on how to geocode a single coordinate. So the library expect, expects the coordinates to be in the form of a tuple, consisting of you know the latitude and the longitude, and um, you just inv you just call the get function in the library, and that so that's done executing and. This is how the output looks like. It's like a it's it's a dictionary with the keys being admin one and two for the administrative regions. CC is the country code, uh, which is the two-letter country code, and this is the latitude and longitude for the place, which is uh, Barbican. So that's how you would query for a single coordinate. Now, for multiple coordinates, the library expects either a tuple of tuples or a list of tuples. So this is how you would uh, define it, and this is these are the results for these three coordinates. And so by default, like I said, the mode is two, so it's uh, uh, the multiprocessor mode. Uh, you can define a single uh, process by just setting mode equals one. Um, I'd recommend using uh, mode one for like very small inputs uh, because you, it's, it, it would be a bit of an overkill to use you know, multiprocessing. So uh, by small input, I mean anything less than um, 10,000 uh, coordinates. So it would be uh, sufficient to use uh, mode one. Now this is where I basically load um, a file that contains uh, 10,000 coordinates. Uh, so this is data from our users that run a speed test, so you can see where our users are coming from. Uh, so this is how I would load the file from CSV into a tuple of coordinates. And so these are the top five uh, 
coordinates. So as you can see, the latitude and longitude are strings, but it doesn't matter. The uh, library takes care of uh, conver converting that into float. And you just call the search function. And as you can see, it's done executing. And the output is written to the output file. So I'll just show you what that looks like. So yeah, oops. So that's the input that we had, and this is the place, the administrative regions, and the country. Um, so it's, it's it's quite fast uh, uh, in the way that it uh, processes th this input. Um, so for the performance results, I basically run benchmarks on my MacBook Pro, and you know this is what the performance looks like. So as I said, for like very small inputs, you wouldn't see like um, a huge uh, benefit in uh, running in mode two, but for like 10 million coordinates, basically mode two runs in like about uh, 27 seconds on my MacBook Pro. So uh, it's uh, really fast and efficient in that sense. Uh, one thing I'd like to mention is that we also run, we also use this library in Spark. Um, so within Spark, since Spark handles, you know, uh, scheduling tasks into different uh, machines and cores, uh, I'd recommend just using mode one because it, I don't think you would get like a huge uh, performance boost by running mode 2 if you're using this in Spark. Um, now applications, so this is again the data that I just showed. This is just showing the top 20 regions in the UK where our users run speed tests and London is number one. Uh, so this is quite useful in, in the area of doing some kind of pre-filtering to basically focus on like a subset of data that you have most number of users in. Um, and it'll inform a lot of our uh, uh, decisions in terms of marketing and stuff like that. Um, you can also load that output CSV file into uh, Google Fusion tables and filter by region so you can see where you know the users are. So this is just showing you the data points where users run speed tests within London. As you can see, it's got a pretty good uh, uh, coverage within uh, you know the greater London region. So these are just two applications. So I'd like to end with just talking about you know the contributions that I received from the community. So uh, when I released this initially, this only supported uh, Python 2.7. So uh, and very soon, like I started getting feedback that people wanted Python 3. So with the help of uh, um, Brandon and David, I was able to do that. Um, and quite recently, there was actually a C++ wrapper written around this library. This might be the wrong audience for that, but if anybody uses C++, uh, there's like a wrapper around uh, you know, the Python library. So this is how you would build it and use it. Um, so with that, I'd like to end my talk. Thanks for your attention. Um, this is my uh, uh, Twitter handle. I'll uh, share these slides up on Twitter if any anybody wants a copy. Um, thanks. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, I have about 90,000 uh, pairs of GPS coordinates, and I would like to transform them into street address, house number, and okay. kind of stuff. So obviously, Google QR code to reverse tool would not work for that amount of data, or I don't need to do it for at least half a year or so. How do you solve it? Um, so that's something that I have tried to look at. So. Um, I haven't found like a database that I could use that contains these addresses. Um, like uh, uh, GeoNames has a lot of places, so I could like maybe drill down to like much finer regions that you can use. But I'm not sure if you can get uh, you know the, to the uh, granular uh, granularity of like a street and so on. So uh, I'm not sure. I haven't looked at that problem. So. Okay. Right. Okay. Right. Right. So yeah. Um, yeah, that could be one thing that I could look at. So yeah. Cool. Yeah. So, one problem I've been having with uh, geocoded data is generally excluding fake ones, such as people who decide that they're going to be somewhere in Antarctica, or but fundamentally it's stuff that's in the middle of the ocean. Right. So would it be? Can, is it, is, is it going to give results of, I don't have any geocode for this information, or is it going to give me 
will it set, what, what kind of results will it get if somebody decides to put in the middle of the ocean? Right, so it's going to return a place that's closest to that location. So what, I, what you could do is probably filter out based on the distance that, you know, that location is from the place. Yeah. So using the uh, uh, latitude and longitude have some kind of uh, 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 threshold. So if it's really far away from the place that this uh, uh, library returns, you can probably ignore that. So that's maybe one way you can filter that out. So you're using a KD tree, but how many points do you have in the KD tree? So that's about uh, 150,000 places. So that's basically that whole uh, GeoNames uh, database for uh, places with population. So, I mean, one thing you can do is kind of cut things up into squares, and then each one has a KD tree, and then you can bucket. So you know you only need to have one KD tree for London, say, and then you have much smaller things. So maybe you can gain performance by. Oh, Do right. One check to see if you're in a grid cell and then using KD tree in that. Right, right, right. Okay. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. Thanks. Um, all right, so if there's nothing else, so this is like a very quick talk. Thanks for your attention.